Welcome to Celebrity Acts 2 version of the world of entertainment. My partner John Coleman and I are with our favorite Hollywood historian, Manny Pacheco. Hey, hey. Manny, this is entertainment. What do you mean? Our yes. version of our version. <laughs> How yeah. dare art? How dare oh. you? How oh. dare you? <laughs> hey, Manny, um, not long ago we were talking about our favorite directors and favorite films and stuff. And um, we really never brought up the name Orson Welles, who many people think is, you know, the best director that ever lived. But he had a really mixed career. Uh, tell us about Orson. Orson Welles today is probably, along with Hitchcock, the most favorite topic of any film historian or uh, film uh, teacher. You know, when they, when they when they're professors of film in colleges, sure. Orson Welles' name always comes up. Now, I teach media studies, and I like to talk more about the more uh, the more obscure names as opposed to a Hitchcock, but I just can't get away from Orson Welles. There is so much there. Um, he was a boy wonder. At the age of 23, he was the toast of Broadway. He uh, created a Haitian version of Macbeth um, that basically set the standard for Black artists to perform this fabulous Shakespearean play. Uh, he was a prolific voice actor for those great radio plays, often appearing in as many as 25 dramas a week, including as Lamont Cranston, the shadow. Yes. He had the, the ability to look men's minds. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and he was also um, received a grant that was given during the Great Depression by uh, the uh, Roosevelt administration as part of the Recovery Act so that he could then uh, uh, assemble a brilliant team of actors, which he, he called the Mercury Theater Playhouse, actors such as Joseph Cotton, Agnes Moorhead. I mean, just great, great actors that went on to have really wonderful careers. Norman Lloyd's another one. His partner was John Hausman, who turned out to be a great uh, producer, director, and then wins an Academy Award late in his career for Best Supporting Actor for the film Paper Chase. Yep. And all the while, he was the host of a Sunday night program on CBS that featured a, a great stories from uh, wonderful um, authors. So he might do a story like of Mice and Men from Steinbeck, or he might do a story from, let's say, I don't know, uh, Ernest Hemingway, or any of the great great storytellers that that were big in the first half of the 20th century. Yeah, you, yeah. You're using the, you uh, sort of have introduced him uh, with the word but capitalized and perhaps italicized by saying, well, you know, people almost force you to talk about him. And yes, he did have things that were notable, but well, uh, because, why, why, why are you a little offish on him? Well, because, because the two things he did, even then they were controversial. His big moment came when he decided that he would run a play the day before Halloween on a Sunday night, mm. which by the way, wasn't even the most popular show on Sunday night. The most popular show at 8 p.m. on Sunday night was the Chase and Sanborn Hour with really questionable stars in, in Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen. And I only say questionable not because of their talent, but it's hard to, to fathom that a, a ventriloquist act would be popular on radio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense because it's a visual medium. But anyway, that said, that was the popular show. So when he decides to do the War of the Worlds, people didn't tune in at the beginning, so they didn't get to hear that they were going to do a, you know, the the George Orwell's War of the Worlds. They were going to, they were basically, uh, uh, they were, uh, I'm sorry, the H.G. Wells, I say George Orwell, the H.G. Wells War of the Worlds. They, they didn't say, that they didn't hear this. They were listening to Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen. So that when the musical number came up, you know, uh, Nelson Eddy began to sing. People did what they normally do today with channel surfing. They would do the, the knob twirling and they enter into the War of the Worlds as it happening with bulletins as they break. And that was really big in the 1930s because remember, we had the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, the Lindbergh kidnapping, the onslaught or the onset of war that was about to happen with 
with with Hitler in, in, in Europe. So lots of really negative things were going on. And all of a sudden you hear a bulletin and we're being attacked by aliens. Yeah. And if you heard that in the 1930s, the term alien could be used for somebody who didn't live in this country. So all of a sudden people thought we were being attacked by Germany. And so that scared a lot of people. And then there were actually people who bought the idea that we were actually being invaded by Martians. And so this made a name for, for Orson Welles. He became an international star overnight. RKO came calling. They wanted him and they wanted to sign him. Now, while I'm saying this, you got to keep in mind, he's 25 years old. 25! <laughs> he's a kid! And they sign him to a film contract on the hopes that his first film will be a cinematic version of War of the Worlds. Well, he got in so much trouble with War of the Worlds, the last thing he wanted to do was a cinematic version of the, of, of the piece. Instead, he went directly after the media mogul of all time, William Randolph Hearst. And worse than that, he went after his mistress, Marion Davies. And so William Randolph Hearst was really, really upset about all this and um, did everything he could to lambast the film Citizen Kane. And he would do things like if, if, if a, a movie studio wanted to release it or a movie theater wanted to play it, he would take away the advertising in his papers. And he had papers from coast to coast. He could ruin a business by taking away their advertising. So nobody ran the movie until finally uh, they did like a year and a half later. And um, and then it was uh, campaigned against and it, and it lost the best picture of the year to How Green Was My Valley. And by that moment, now he's like 28, he became a has-been. Nobody wanted to touch Orson Welles. Hmm. Yeah, kind of a tragic story. Yeah, and, 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 and then from that point, it's just a long journey down. Yeah. The Magnificent Ambersons, which was his next role, he um, made the movie, and then Z Zanuck basically just changed the ending without consulting him, mm. which was very tragic. And then nobody would give him any more creative control, and he had to go begging for money for the rest of his career for every film that he had to make. So he would do really dumb things like commercials, and he would appear like on Carson just to make a couple of bucks so that he could finance his next movie. And mm -hmm. uh, in those cases, like The Lady from Shanghai or uh, uh, or uh, A Touch of Evil in the 1950s, you know, th those were those were the movies that were made. And they were good, but it's now you're seeing a bloated uh, uh, Orson Welles. He doesn't look healthy. And it's just a really sad journey that here's here's a flaming star of an actor who became a has-been at age 30. And wow. it's, it's, it's just tragic. Yeah. And yet, he's remembered for his accomplishments before that. I think uh, off-screen, uh, uh, I think you, you described it uh, really well off-screen. And I had never thought of, in terms of this, as a meteor brightly shining and then crashing to, to Earth or disappearing with a bright tail. And he that it was the tail that kept him going for another well, 30, he, 40 years. He, he burns his bridge at CBS. RKO comes calling. He burns, he burns his bridge with William Randolph Hearst. I mean, when you burn that many bridges in the media industry, and I mean, CBS and, let's face it, CBS and William Randolph Hearst, they had a lot of reach and a lot of pull. Yeah. And, and, and RKO got burned by the whole thing. Herman Mankiewicz, even though he wins an Oscar for best writing for Citizen Kane, never really writes another script again. Uh, I, I mean, a lot of people were hurt. The only one that kind of was unscathed by the whole thing was John Hausman. But uh, I'm telling you, he, he would have to work the rest of his life doing menial type things uh, for screen appearances just to uh, try to raise enough money for his next projects, whatever they may be. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a, that was a, this is a pretty modern look for this show. It's, it's a downer. I get, I get <laughs> yeah. it. It's a, but you know what? Every so often, you know, you talk the truth. Um, most people remember him as for his bright, shining moment. Yeah. And then the rest of it was was tough. I remember actually I remember watching him, not with that the thoughts of he was a husband, on Carson. I remember seeing him there. Okay, yeah. uh, looking a little rotund, and uh, I think even smoking a cigar, maybe back in the day. 
uh, and just looking like he was tired. And then after he was done with Carson, he'd make a trek over to Pink's and have himself a, a, a couple or, or four or five hot dogs. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, I'm, not ki- I'm not kidding when I say that. And yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't mention one more film he did that, you know, belongs in that pantheon of, of his legend, and that's The Third Man. I mean, he was yeah. very, very good with the third man. He was very lucky in one capacity. He never lost the friendship of those Mercury players. So he worked with Joe Cotton, and Joe Cotton was very loyal to him because basically Orson Welles discovered Joseph Cotton, and he worked with Agnes Moorhead. He worked with Norman Lloyd, and, and Norman Lloyd went on to you know for 106 years, you know, as a as a director of of, of Hitchcock movies and as an actor. I mean, so you know, the people that came out of his work went on to do some really wonderful things and they remain friends with Orson Welles. But, you know, friendship doesn't translate to, you know, um, money, you know, in, in terms of producing films. And that and that was the the real rub for Orson Welles. And that, I think that really broke him. I think that broke him um, as a as a creative type. And, and that's that's the sad part of the story, I think. Well, here's to Orson Welles. I remember his best work. Remember him fondly. Well, that's that's great. Anyway, yeah, let's uh, let's raise a toast to Orson Welles and and the movies he made and and the, really the impact he had uh, on screen and and with a, a radio audiences as well. So so let's employ a little uh, magic, uh, movie magic, raise our glass, <laughs> and everybody raise your glass to Orson Welles. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.